Welcome back everyone. I'm just about to adjust this truss rod. I wanted to show the length of the neck. You can see there's a huge swoop in that. I can't see the camera as I'm adjusting, but I'm going to give it a couple of turns and uh, check it again. Definitely functioning, that truss rod. Okay, yeah, I think you can see that in the camera. The uh, neck moving as we adjust it. Okay, well Frank, this lesson is uh, especially for you because I know you're, you're doing all the uh, work on bases. Now I do have the two long blocks, I'll bring the camera around and show uh, everybody else in here. So this spreads out and gives you the support along those long flexible necks. And this neck is actually quite flexible. So I'll bring you around for another look at this. So there's multiple spots all over this neck that need to be touched up to get the action down to where we want it. You can see that the truss rod's working well. It's got the lay of the neck pretty darn straight, so I'm, I'm happy with that. And of course with a maple fingerboard you've got to mask the whole thing off before you get started. And that's part of the job. This is definitely one of those jobs where you've got to have this thing tuned with the strings the customer's using to the pitch that he's using. This is just standard pitch, of course, with the bass. And you've got to check it under, under string load to find all those discrepancies. But you could see at the beginning of the video there was a major swoop in this and the action was terrible because no one addressed all of these problems. And unless you kind of know what to look for and you're set up properly, like this base is supported at the neck to body junction. Full support here, full support along the length of that flexible neck. From here to here, it's supported with the pivoting neck assembly. No flexing, so when we go to touch this up, the neck is not flexing. I've taken some red pencil and kind of marked all these high spots. Here's our first spot. It is only under the G string. The D is fine, the A is fine, the low E is fine. So there's just that one spot. So the second spot is here and it's just the A string and the low E. So the G and the D in this case are fine. So we've got two spots so far. Up here the G is fine, the D is fine, it's just the A string. The low E, yeah, it's fine too. So you can see we've got one, two, three spots and I'm going to a little bit smaller straight edge here. We've got that G, D is fine, A is fine, and there's a little bit of discrepancy here on the low E. Next spot, G string needs a touch up, D is fine, A is fine, and low E. And the last spot is up here, second last fret on the G, D is fine, A is fine, and there is just a hint on the low E. So what we've got in total, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen different spots that need to be touched. Now because this is another one of those jobs that we're doing under string load, I've got two pieces of hockey puck here and we're going to just raise that up to get enough room to get that file underneath the strings on this end. Let's go to the other end. So this end is a similar deal. This is as close to the nut as we're getting. That'll do the trick. Now I will back these off just a fraction of a turn and after I do this I will go over all of those spots that we checked a minute ago to make sure that they're still lighting up and that guarantees that the neck is in the same orientation it was before we hiked it up with those hockey pucks. All right, we're back. Here's our reality check to make sure the neck is in the same location as it was previously, which it is. So on this one, we just had the A and the E. Here, we've got the A string, E is fine, D is fine, and here we've got the G, D is fine, A is fine, G string, D, a is fine and low E. And lastly, we've got the G, D is fine, A is fine, and low E. So all of those spots are going to be taken care of. 
we raise the strings up to make enough clearance for the mill file. So that is what we're going to do next. I've got some tape so that we don't file the strings. Let's get back to our straight edges here. No ticking now. That's done. Here. That's done. Here. Yeah, that's done too. Step down to a smaller straight edge. Here. Done. Done. Here. Yep. Good. Yeah, no, that's good. Down to our smallest straight edge. It may seem like an extra hassle, but it's a lot cheaper than a CNC machine. So now we can get on with the rest of the job. And obviously with a maple fingerboard, it's, uh, you know, quite a bit extra work. All the masking and preparation takes us longer and longer than the job itself. But the idea is to cover your tracks, and if you do it right, It'll look like the base has never been touched. Okay, so at this point, we can pull the strings off. Get it nice and tight for a good look. And now we can do our little tiny bit of recrowning. Man, it does not take much. Very light touch here, but it made the difference between the guitar being tolerable or not. The action, as you saw at the beginning, is pretty, uh, pretty atrocious. But if you're not set up to do this type of work, your only option is to hike up the strings until the buzzing goes away. And, but that's not the solution. That's all it took to recrown. It's fine. So now we're ready to use that scrub block and we'll scrub out the tooling marks and bring those crowns back to center, buff them to a mirror shine and it'll be ready to go. Now that we've taken that truss rod tension off, well, the neck is going in a back bow. Here we can loosen that truss rod off and get it as straight as possible. So that takes care of the rockin'. Now we can switch over to our scrub block. So this is our scrub block and this is 400 grit. So I'm just essentially taking out any trace of the uh, tooling marks of the file with this. And that just kind of bumps over the crowns and scrubs them back to center. And now that we've got them perfectly level along the trajectory of the string path, now we're just giving them a quick scrub, 400 grit. And then step that up to 600 grit. You can hear audibly the difference in the reduction of uh, grit. 600 grit is almost dead silent compared to the 400 grit. Second round is 600. And now we've got emery cloth the 1200 grit this time.
Let me load that up. And we are ready to buff. Much better. So now he'll be able to drop that action down nice and tight. Now this will give us a much better idea of where those pickups need to sit. Be able to bring this one down for sure. Get a tracing off that fret to get us started. I'm cutting that radius on the edge of the radius disc sander. That's what we're after. And this now will take out all of the guesswork piece of two-sided tape, some low-density foam, and this will guarantee that Dave can always have a perfect radius match from the bridge to the fretboard radius. Now that I've got the new strings on, I've got a tension to concert pitch. With this neck, it's extremely flexible. And while the strings were off, I put all of the truss rod load on beforehand. I've essentially forced the neck with the strings off into a back bow. And now we're relying on the string tension to pull it up straight. So we've got full string load, tuned to concert pitch, and we still have this back bow. I'm going to back that truss rod off now until we get rid of that back bow. Releasing the tension of the truss rod while under load is never an issue. But with these base necks, sometimes you know you might be asking a bit too much of the truss rod to tighten it up under full load. Okay, that's it. No more rocking. We got the neck where we want it. So now we can proceed with setting up the action on the two outside strings first. So we backed that truss rod off until we got the neck nice and straight. We adjusted the two outside strings for optimum height or action. And now those two middle strings that we hiked up out of the way, we're bringing those in until they both just barely kiss the wood of that radius gauge. I'm trying to 
hoping the camera's picking this up. So now on the underside diameter of the strings, we've got a perfect match to the fingerboard radius. And that takes all the guesswork out of matching the radius of the fingerboard to the radius of the saddles. And now that that final adjustment's been done, now we line up the intonation on those two inside saddles. Okay, so mission complete and intonated for the new strings. All the frets have been edge dressed, level crowned and polished. And as you saw, that truss rod was kind of set up and then gradually backed off under full string load until we got this action right where it should be. All done. Here's a series of triads that I used to just check the intonation. Then I'll do that exact same series, an octave lower. It's been a few years since I've played bass, but one of the things that I remember switching from guitar to bass, I'm sure any guitar players will, be, will know what I'm talking about. You're obviously traveling a greater distance. So because you're traveling a greater distance, one of the exercises I used to do is a, a 13th arpeggio. It makes you aware of how important those open strings are to sort of make the position shift on a bass. Starting with a low E, I'll go E, G, B, D. Now D allows me to shift. E, G, B, D, F, A, C. Next one would be F, A, C, E, G, B, D. Next one would be G, B, D, F, A, C, E. And then a, C, E, G, B, D, F, and then B, D, F, A, C, E, G, and then G allows me to shift, C, E, G, B, D, F, A, and then D, F, A, C, E, G, B, just another way to kind of move around the bass with the least amount of grief <laughs> coming from the short scale guitar. I'll come up with licks or ideas kind of based on that arpeggio, the first arpeggio, E, E, G, B, D, F, A, it's actually F sharp, but E, G, B, D, F, A, C.
So here I've got an uh, octave E, and then a fifth, and a ninth. This is the neck pickup only. Back that off. This is the bridge pickup only. And this is both. Mm -hmm. 